Hi, welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel at the two o'clock block. Um, this is the military in Hawaii. And today we're going to talk about the Marines, uh, specifically the Marine Corps base uh, in Hawaii with um, it's, uh, I guess, the commander of the base, uh, Colonel Spiros Komparakis. I pronounced that right, Colonel? In. All right. Okay. And the chief of staff, who's a civilian, a former Marine, Doug Wadsworth. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us on the show. Thank you so much for having us today. We really appreciate the time. Well, Absolutely. I want to, you know, get an update on um, on the base and, and the Marine Corps in general. I think it's important that people in Hawaii know, you know, what we have and and um, how it evolves and its connection with the state. You know, um, my my recollection, the good way my age is that I remember when it was Marine Corps Air Base, Hawaii, and there were <laughs> actual planes flying in and out all day. But somewhere along the line, that stopped. Uh, so. Can you talk about that for a minute? I mean, what's the history of this base? So, uh, Jay, thank you so much for the, for the question. Uh, so Marine Corps Base Hawaii has a, a steep and rich tradition here uh, in uh, Oahu specifically, but kind of across the archipelago. Um, we just celebrated, we did a flipper um, uh, event in remembrance of uh, Pearl Harbor Day just a few days ago. And uh, what we remembered there and what we, uh, focused on this, this was actually a Navy installation time. And so over the, over the years, this has transitioned to a Marine Corps base, but we still are a maritime team. We still have Navy helicopters, Navy aircraft flying from our airfield as well as Marine Corps aircraft uh, flying. And then it's also the home of our third Marine regiment uh, supported with logistics and other command element uh, parts of the Marine Air Ground Task Force. And so today, uh, we call it kind of the Hawaii MAGTAF, the Hawaii Marine Corps Air Ground Task Force, and we provide uh, forces out to the third MAF or three MAF Marine Expeditionary Force in Okinawa uh, for any of the events that could happen, whether they be humanitarian assistance, uh, regular rotations, or if called upon to uh, to go against a facing threat. And so our team here is made up of, uh, with myself and Chief of Staff Doug Wadsworth. And then we also have a sergeant major and that's our command team. And we basically provide support uh, to our tenants to make sure that the base is ready, providing day in and day out what's required. An airfield that's ready and open and conducting operations, a training area, which is a uh, Marine Corps training area, Bellows, right outside of Oyanalo, uh, all the way over to Eva Beach where we have the Pulo uh, Range Training Facility. Um, and we also even have a liaison over at the uh, Wahaloa training area uh, with the Army because it's that training area is so important to us. So we have a person stationed with the Army at that uh, training base. And so I'm going to turn it over to Doug because he's, he's got the continuity. He's been here since 2012 and he served here even before that to talk a little bit more about the history. Yeah, Doug, you are a very picture of continuity. <laughs> Can you talk about how it works? I, I can, you know, interestingly uh, to me, I, I, I love history. Uh, and if you look at the history of the Marine Corps in Hawaii, uh, especially aviation that started over at Marine Corps Air Station Eva, uh, over by Barbara's Point, you know, it's no longer open. Uh, our base, you know, that we, that you talked about, it used to be, you know, Marine Corps Air Station Kaneohe started out as a, an army fort and then transitioned to include NAS uh, Kaneohe which is you know, what the CO talked about uh, during the December 7th attack. It was an actual Navy base. And it wasn't until the 50s uh, that the Navy departed and the Marine Corps took over. Uh, and then in 1994, it actually became Marine Corps Base Hawaii and encompassed all of those places that, that Spiro talked about. Uh, you know, most people think of Marine Corps Base Hawaii as just being Makapu Peninsula, uh, but it, it exceeds that. You know, we, we do a lot more than that around the island and even, even a a small parcel over in Molokai. So you, just gave me a you just gave me a flashback to Bellows. Uh, the Colonel mentioned Bellows. And I remember, I mean, I, I started, I came here in the Coast Guard in 1965. <clears throat> so I saw a lot of things, including, of course, military. And Bellows has an airfield. Do you, do you, you, know, you don't notice it, but it's there. And it's not used. I, I doubt it'll ever be used again. But Bellows was an airbase. An airfield. <laughs> Actually, like you'd that. be surprised that it is still used. Is um, that right? Yeah. It, it's not used in the fashion that it started. The, the, the runways aren't active as runways, but we have landing zones over there. 
uh, in our helicopters and our MV-22, our tilt rotor aircraft, pretty routinely operate in and out of there on those runways. So very interesting, a neat place. And, and well, you know what? I'm sorry, Colonel. Doug, to Doug's point on that, um, the way we use space in Hawaii is really, uh, I'm, I'm impressed every day. It's a small facility, but the way that our, um, our kind of operations and training folks have developed that place is we can, uh, we can conduct a, a raid, we can conduct a landing, we can conduct training to prepare our Marines for almost anything they'll see in almost any country they'll go into in the Indo-Pacific region. And so it's really impressive what the team here is able to do with an old airfield that still has a few old buildings and a few new buildings that uh, prepare Marines for um, the full range of military operations. Yeah, especially including helicopters, which don't require a long runway or anything like that, yeah. <clears throat> I remember uh, you, you have a, uh, a significant rifle range over on the uh, east side of uh, Kaneohe. Is that still in operation? It, it is. We have a, a, a great range training facility um, located. Uh, um, I'm, I'm going to step back a second, and you're talking about the, the crater area where we have. Yes. Uh, that crater is, is a beautiful, pristine location where we're able to control fires very, very well. Um, but at the same time, uh, we have a team of um, environmentalists that actually help protect many of the things we have. We actually have um, the, I want to get it right, the red-footed boobies uh, there that nest in the trees. And so we are able to create a beautiful and a perfect location for them to thrive in the same place where we're conducting live fire exercises and we have good fire breaks. So uh, we get the reports when a fire breaks out, we have uh, fire uh, suppression systems. And then we also have good fire breaks that, that keep the, the blue footed or the red footed boobies uh, protected very, very well. You know, I just a digression, but in the day when I was visiting Kanyoi base on a regular basis, uh, you know, it was the day when we were more active in, in, um, in the Middle East and Central Asia. And I tell you, every time I passed by the sentries there at the, at the guardhouse, it welled up for me. And I would thank the sentries. I know the sentries may or may not have been deployed there, but I thanked them anyway. I thanked them for their national, national service. And I, and I tell you the truth, um, I see the Marines as like, you know, at the frontier. The Marines are taking chances, being exposed, maybe more than the other services. Uh, and therefore, I, I have a, a stronger emotional feeling about them than any other. Uh, am I right about that, or, or uh, should I just relax over it? I think uh, Doug and I were talking about this earlier today, and, and so we also want to say thank you for your service in the Coast Guard. I think there's a kindred spirit between those services that choose the word Semper in their mottos, and whether it be Semper Fidelis or Semper Paratus, um, it's those smaller units that uh, create great small teams that go out and do the bidding of our country um, that kind of have a special place in, in, in definitely my heart. Um, I work very closely with the Coast Guard in my last job uh, down in Bogota, Colombia. And so I, I saw that same spirit in the Coast Guard and what they do to go against uh, you know, narco traffickers and in support of foreign countries. And it's amazing what small folks who, are, who allow leadership to be pushed down to the lowest level, where we allow corporals to be leaders and we focus on you know, low level leadership they're willing to make um, and take a few risks as long as it's tied together with our, you know, kind of our core ethos, our integrity, and our values of honor, courage, and commitment. So we kind of weave those things together through integrity, and then we teach that to at the at the lowest level for lieutenants, for captains, for corporals and sergeants, so they can go forth and do our bidding. And then we trust them. And if they do something wrong, then we hold them accountable, and we counsel them. We try to make them better. Yeah, why does this remind me of uh, General Stackpole, uh, who I knew, uh, and it was a kind of uh, immediate leadership thing. You didn't have to spend five minutes with him, and you were ready to follow him wherever he went. You know, that's special Marine quality. So, what is what is uh, what happens at Kaneohe these days? I mean, it's mostly training. Um, uh, what what's the you know the the, the kinds of activities? Um, that the troops there conduct. Chief, can I turn this one over to you? <laughs> sure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, you know, we, we talk about, uh, when we talk about our mission at Marine Corps Base Hawaii, we, 
we refer to the three P's uh, in its producing readiness, projecting power, and providing or promoting resiliency. And so it's, it's a combination of things, you know, and while most of the focus for us who, who actually work at the base as opposed to the operational tenants are focused on the training part of that, or supporting the tenants so that they get the training they need uh, to go into a combat or a contingency situation. Uh, we also uh, project, we do have an air station still uh, with aircraft that come in and out. It's not just Marine aircraft. Uh, the Air Force uses it routinely. Uh, so we project power. And we have uh, teams of, of cyber you know, folks who work uh, doing real world missions. We have a Navy Maritime Patrol, you know, when Barbers Point closed, uh, the P3s moved over there, they sent over to Marine Corps Base Hawaii uh, and have since transitioned to the P8. And so on a daily basis, they're out hunting submarines. And so it's a combination of things. And then lastly, it's hugely important uh, and we put much more focus on it these days than we used to on that resiliency piece, not only for our Marines uh, who work very long hours, who deploy, uh, whether that be to a combat zone or just to uh, a training deployment, we focus on them, their mental health, uh, taking care of their families while they're gone. And so everything from child development centers to schools, uh, to counseling uh, and, and sexual assault prevention, all of those things go into what the base provides for all the folks uh, who live and work there. Mm. And, you know, and just, it, to, just to add to what Doug said, those three Ps you will see when you come on to our base, you know, it is the reduce readiness, promote resiliency, project power. And they're, they're not just a mantra for us, it, it really is important. I would say if we were to add a P today, uh, especially during COVID, it would probably be protecting our resources as well. Um, because uh, all of those things can't be done unless we're protecting our people, our location, and to include our environment and, uh, and our community. And so I, I think that protection piece, it, it's, it's intertwined in that message as well. Yeah, let's let's turn to that. That's a part of the part of the show today for sure. It's uh, you know how how COVID came upon you and Kanye kind of, and uh, what you did and had to do and are doing and will be doing um, to deal with it. So uh, I'll, I'll tell you a little story um, on how I got here. I was supposed to show up uh, in late April, early May. Um, because of COVID, I ended up taking a humanitarian flight. Uh, out of Bogota, Colombia to Fort Lauderdale, um, and then transitioning to a commercial flight a day later and, and landing in Hawaii almost 60 days after my original arrival. And so I was, uh, it was very strange going through uh, Fort Lauderdale to Miami in about 35, 40 minutes in a taxi on an afternoon around 5 p.m. in the afternoon, zero traffic. It was very strange to be in Miami and Fort Lauderdale with no traffic at the beginning of June. Um, and so when I arrived, what's special about Marine Corps Base Hawaii is the first person who met me was Doug Wadsworth uh, with, our, with a, a sergeant, uh, Hernandez. And those two were the first two people that I met and they're part of our HANA, our HANA, our family here. So it was really special to me to be met by, you know, people from my own command team, knowing that I might be a threat to them. And the mitigations that they had put into place on my arrival, coming from an unknown place like Bogota, Colombia, where I could have been a threat to my own base by showing up, they had mitigations that they put into place and they were very good from wearing gloves to wearing masks. And this was all you know, fairly early in COVID. And they got a van big enough where all my stuff and me were separated from them. And they got to the base and then they put me in a room and locked me in for 14 days and said, don't come out. Um, and, <laughs> no, no and man, that, no officer is above the law. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. And, and it was, it was amazing. I, I, I live by that 14 day mantra. It's the gold standard for COVID. Um, we'd love to get that number down to 10 days or seven days. It would adjust how we do our operations, but 14 days is kind of the gold standard. Uh, and we'll, con we continue to evaluate now that we're farther along. Um, but you know, I came into a situation where Doug had been fighting this fight from the beginning here in Hawaii, and I brought it with it some uh, some experience in Colombia, where I was working at the interagency level to help a partner to look at best practices for those countries. And so together we came up with an idea where we will make decisions 
methodically using good data, looking and seeing what's going on on our base and off base, and then pausing for about two weeks to see what the results of our decisions were. And so as we've transitioned to HPCon Charlie, uh, you know, a heightened state of awareness to wearing masks indoor all the time. You know, we came through the Father's Day when everyone thought it was about to get really good. And we came through July and then a bump in August. And so we watched the trends very, very, very closely with great experts who's, who provide support from Defense Health Agency, from our medical clinics. And then the other thing we do, and I think this is where technology comes into play, is I have a meeting every single week with every base commander from Oahu. And we do it just like this in this forum. And we talk about what's going on in our bases, how our numbers are looking, uh, what questions we're getting from the local uh, population, community, and government, and making sure that we're kind of aligned when it comes to what mitigations we put into place on our bases. Um, I've been really impressed. Simple things that you wouldn't think of, but a self-help team of CBs who puts plexiglass, uh, you know, glued and uh, together with blocks, two by fours, and all of a sudden the post office is a safe place for someone to work out of. Our exchange is a safe place to work out of for our employees. And, and we don't think of that as technology, but it really is part of the technology of how to beat or at least how to mitigate. Sure. And that's what we use here. We're not trying to beat COVID. We're trying to mitigate and operate in the age of COVID. It's like sea state for the Navy or the Coast Guard or weather. Um, it's just something we have to learn to operate in until we have the, the vaccine to everyone. And, and any, anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, sure. The uh, Jay, I think you're when you alluded to or, or, or talked about the sentries at the gate uh, and the young Marines. You know, Marines traditionally. Oh, sorry about that. I've got a. Marines traditionally uh, are very hands-on. You know, they like to, to get Marines into a formation and whether you're briefing a mission or you're briefing you know, a Liberty plan for the weekend, uh, we like to have people close and, and in tight. Uh, and so this was a real culture change when we went into the pandemic uh, and were required to do things from afar. Uh, and as Colonel Cooper Ruckus said, it's, uh, it's really been an amazing leap forward, not only for our folks who run our communication systems to get them up to speed, to be able to do things like Zoom calls or teleconferences and those sorts of things, but it's the people themselves, some of whom uh, aren't real savvy with computers that we've had to train as well. Uh, and what I've seen happen is uh, certainly, again, alluding to the CEO's comment about the other commanders, not only on our own base, but our interactions with the other bases, the Navy, you know, the Air Force, the Army, uh, we've actually gotten closer, you know, to those folks. You know, before we started the show, we talked a little bit about the collegiality, you know, amongst the commanders and the requirement to, to cooperate. Uh, during a pandemic, everybody has to cooperate. And, uh, you know, using technology to, to connect and to stay tight and close uh, so that one entity isn't making a decision or going a direction that's opposite the other is hugely important. Uh, so it's, it's worked out well for us. It's been a challenge, however. As the chief of staff, um, you're kind of like the executive officer, aren't you? I am. We, we don't really have an executive officer. We, we have an operations officer uh, who, when the commander's gone, will step in and do the you know, military justice thing. So, so I operate, you know, part executive officer, part uh, conductor. If you consider the staff uh, an orchestra uh, and the CO is writing the music, I help make sure that the woodwinds play well with the... Uh, with the drum set. Uh, you must be reading my mind because a couple of days ago, uh, we had a show with a with a um, a, 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 a chorale, a bunch a bunch of uh, fellows and girls who sing together. And in the past, they would sing in the same room. And uh, when you sing choir style, just like you're talking about the Marines, you're together. You're within inches of each other. You're you're bouncing off the person next to you. In fact, it's very hard for you to function without that. So now they sing in separate Zoom boxes in separate places. And, and uh, to hear their director talk about it, they get very nervous. They, they're very uncomfortable not having people near them because part of being in a choir, in a chorale, um, 
is having people right next to you and playing off their sound. So I imagine the same kind of process goes on. It's that musical, you know, collaboration thing. It's togetherness. And certainly the Marine Corps, maybe more than other services are together. If I were a Marine, I mean, I'm in my mind's eye, maybe someday, maybe, I, maybe when I get younger, uh, I'll be a Marine, but I would feel uncomfortable uh, without having, uh, you know, my group around me. And now you're saying, well, wait, no, you got to, you got to deal by zoom and you don't necessarily, you have to, you know, maintain social distancing and, you know, you're not proximate the way you used to be. And so what is, what does that do to the culture in the Marine Corps? I, I really like to hear your views on that. The, Doug, why don't you start? Yeah, I, you know, you, you're dead on. It's, it's just, even if you talk about a, a regular meeting, and whether it's Marines or a combination of Marines and civilians, uh, we key off of one another. And so, you know, if, if you want to make a comment, you, you kind of do this and, you know, the, the CEO's up front and he goes, hey, Doug, what do you got? And when you're on a teleconference, it's difficult to do that. And so you have to be very methodical about including and having everybody understand who's on, pausing long enough so that people can have that interaction uh, and allowing them to talk. And then monitoring it such that you know, we all have different personalities. Some people are quick to, to want to take the mic and, and run with it. And, and others are, are shy and, and, and less prone. And so you have to kind of call that out a little bit. Uh, meanwhile, people are calling from their homes like we are right now. And maybe the kids who aren't at school because school isn't in session or running around or the dog is barking and uh, it, it really is, is challenging. Uh, to kind of get everybody to focus. Uh, but we're starting to get pretty darn good at it, I think. Well, uh, Colonel, is this changing the culture? Is it changing the, I don't know, the way of looking at things in the Marine Corps? Uh, are, are some of these um, uh, changes in protocols uh, going to be more long lasting than just through the COVID crisis? I think uh, there's a, a real sense of hope that, uh, so we've got the motion from my new comedy on Jennifer Berger, who spent time here in Hawaii, um, about getting us to a different form of Marine Corps that's operating at small teams. And so we, there's some of us who look at COVID and say, well, this is actually an opportunity where we, we should be practicing what our commandant is asking us to do. Um, as we look across the base, we've got different units that do different things. I mean, one of our tenants is uh, South Carolina. Or excuse me, uh, Indo Pacom. And so we've got the Admiral and his staff that sit on Camp Smith, and we make sure the base is safe and secure for him and his staff. And then we also have Marine Corps uh, Forces Pacific, and we have Back of West. And these are very senior places that are in offices. So they have found ways to operate using technology, keep them running at full speed so they can ensure uh, command and control across the Indo Pacom region. And I think that's impressive that they're able to do that. And we hope that we provide a little bit of that infrastructure that uh, allows them to command and control. And then, but we also have very tactical units. We've got uh, air crews that work in very tight spaces together to make sure an aircraft is ready. We've got at the you know, infantry level, we've got fire teams and squads of about 15. And so, one of the things we've talked about a lot with those peer commanders who, who are tenants that live and work on the base uh, is what is your pond? What is your cohort that you have to have working together? And then that is who you spend your time with. And so we're very hopeful that, you know, now the squad might be that tactical unit that's very close to one another who are spending time. And if one of them gets COVID, we fully expect that all 13 to get COVID. And then we take them off the line, we put them in quarantine and uh, they get back on the line in a few weeks. Uh, same thing for that air crew that's about five or six individuals. They have to spend time together. They're a very tight-knit group. They operate, they eat, they sleep, they do everything together. And then if, if the worst case scenario happens, that something happens to that team, then we have a ready crew behind them to pick up the slack. And so these are the ways we have to get through a pandemic where it's not just six feet for everyone, Sometimes you've got mission requirements that, uh, that force people to be together, but that group needs to be a rock solid group that spends time together. And if something's wrong with any one of them, they have to identify it to their chain of command and, and go isolate themselves. And I'm really proud of what I've seen across the base. The Marines do a very good job. The hardest thing we've had to do over the last six months 
is tell a Marine it's okay to not suck it up um, because that's just what you do in the Marine Corps. You know, you've got a cough, you've got a fever, you're not feeling great. Well, then you just work twice as hard. Um, and now we're telling people that's not a red that you know that's not the red badge of courage. That is bringing something in for the rest of the team that actually is a vector that brings in your readiness, not makes you have it. Um, it's taking time, but I think we're doing it. Yeah, if you have if you have a significant number of cases that get by you, uh, that affects your mission readiness. So this is you know for the Marines more than other groups, certainly more than the civilians, uh, it's really critical that you remain healthy as much as possible. You cannot have would, a, a pandemic inside the Marine Corps. And I would add, there's two reasons why that's so important for us. Um, number one, we want clean tenant units that deploy to go to foreign countries without COVID because we don't want to be seen as the vector of COVID taking it to our allies. We've got great allies across the Indo-Pacific, Japan, Thailand. Uh, we're starting to do more operations in, in other countries, Australia. So the last thing we want to do is send a unit there that has COVID. So we work very hard to make sure that those units are, are completely clear of COVID before they depart Hawaii. And the second piece is we've got a we've, we've got a population here that works on the base that are susceptible to issues of COVID. So those young Marines probably aren't going to feel the effects, but we also don't want them to be spreading the virus, even though they're asymptomatic to people who could feel the effects, like their own family members or the people who work in a commissary, PX, um, and facilities maintenance and those types of things. So, so does that mean liberty policy has changed, Doug? Uh, if I'm a, if a young a E1 or E2 and I and I want to run off and have a good time on a weekend. Can I can I do that? And how do you control me so I don't get in trouble on in terms of getting infected? I guess that depends on what your good time consists of, Jay. Uh, <laughs> I'm not telling you. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, or fortunately, I guess I should say, uh, you know, we're not in this alone. Uh, if Waikiki were bustling uh, and we were dealing with this on our own it would be very, very difficult because Marines like to be where people are. Uh, and so they're, despite the, uh, our desire to, to hold them within the base and keep them safe and have activities for them to do, uh, like anybody, they wanna get out and about. But because out and about is so restricted right now uh, and because we've been very careful about uh, taking care of our folks and ensuring they don't get COVID, we put a lot of focus on uh, doing things differently on base to try to invigorate uh, you know, liberty time because it still exists. And it's, it's everything from athletic competitions where you're not getting together, you're doing it individually uh, to uh, art competitions, cooking competitions for families, for children, uh, for the Marines themselves, uh, trying to find things to do on base so that they can stay safe. Uh, and still get some of that resilience that I talked about earlier. Uh, and then as things open up, they're able to get out to the beaches, you know, out and around o Oahu in the state, uh, and then downtown to the degree that restaurants are open and things. And so uh, certainly things have changed, uh, but there are still opportunities out there to have fun uh, and to get in trouble. So we keep our eye on that as well. Yeah, as the Colonel was suggesting, you, you have to stay in touch with what's going on outside the gate and um, you know, adapt yourself to the environment around, the community around, especially now. But uh, you know, we're almost out of time. And uh, Colonel, I wanted to ask you one other question. You, you've had, you've had uh, decades in the service um, and um, you've seen a lot of changes, I'm sure. Um, but there have been uh, you know, profound changes over the, the past few years, both externally you know, operations outside the country and I'm sure within the Marine Corps itself. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you described the horizontal and vertical and collaborative nature of command and various commands uh, in the Marine Corps in the Pacific. Um, how, how have things changed? What are the senior officers talking about? What's the wardroom discussion these days? <laughs> well, I think one of the things we talk about, you know, the, the elephant in the room is COVID. And is it, are we prepared come April, May, June, if a vaccine makes it out in large numbers for what to do next? And do we return to February of 2020 or do we advance to June of 2021? And I think we all agree we wanna to advance to June of 2021 and beyond, 
thinking about how we use technology during COVID to make ourselves better and how do we uh, support our missions, whether it's the base of those things. And I would say the next thing we're looking at is, you know, what is the most likely thing to happen and what is the worst case scenario to happen? So we've got pacing threats who uh, are challenging us um, across the world and whether it be in my last uh, job in South America or here in Indo-PACOM, uh, there, there, are, there are people and countries that want to challenge the United States. And so we in the Marine Corps, uh, from I think private all the way up to the CMOs general, want to be that ready force that if challenged by mother nature or a facing threat, that we can respond not only tonight, but today. Now we say it uh, in, in Okinawa where our higher headquarters is, they say, they used to say fight tonight. Now they say fight today. And our mantra here at Marine Corps Base Hawaii is that we are ready today for the fight tonight. So when they call on us, we want to be ready to go out and support. And the most likely is probably an HADR, a humanitarian assistance disaster relief scenario where we need to go. And the Marine Corps is littoral, which means we, working with our maritime partners, can get into places where other people can't, whether it be by helicopter, by Osprey, by small boat, working with the Navy. I mean, this partnership with the Navy, we talk about it all the time, but I think it's real. And there's a return to our maritime brothers and sisters. And so what I, I would like to see pushing on to June 21 and beyond is what is that relationship with our maritime partners, the Navy and the Coast Guard, and then our allied navies and Marine Corps across indo pacom And how do we just make sure that we're there, not fighting our way in, but being a constant ally um, and friend and the friend of choice. And that's where we have to be in the future. Well, we're in the middle of the COVID. It affects everybody, certainly. It's clear it affects uh, the military as well as everybody else. But query, I don't, and I really don't know the answer. Uh, is there some, is some priority involved for the military and the vaccine? In other words, uh, we know that, for example, if you're 100 years old, you're likely to get a shot. Um, but, but query, if you're um, you know, 20 years old and enlisted Marine, are you likely to get a shot? Is that coming down the pike? Do you have expectations in that regard? So I would say we do have expectations, but you know, healthy aged males and females will probably not be our priority folks for getting uh, a COVID vaccination. It's going to be our first responders just like out in town. In fact, our plan almost mirrors the CDC's plan. It was developed with the CDC. And so Department of um, Health, uh, Defense Health Agency has a great plan to get an initial tranche here to through PMC through uh, Tripler Army Medical Center, and they'll focus on those first responders. Um, and then eventually, as we get second and third and fourth, uh, we will move down a tiered system to get the deployable units to make sure they show up um, at, at, at uh, allied countries completely clean. And then folks like me who work on bases and hopefully are of a healthy age will probably be last in line. <laughs> It's of a healthy, a healthy uh, um, age, and so that's okay. Um, I'll gladly take it when it's time, but I'll also gladly put the right people in front of me to get it to do our bidding wherever they need to go. All right, and Doug, are you in the same place? So you're older then, aren't you? So <laughs> <laughs> Doug gets it tomorrow, right, Doug? <laughs> yeah, I refuse to say. You're only as old as you feel. There you go. <laughs> My own view is that I'm 16 and I'm sticking to it. I like it. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you, Colonel. Colonel Kamparakis, uh, Doug Wasworth uh, from Kaneohe. Make, make that the um, uh, Marine Corps Base Hawaii in Kaneohe. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's been great to talk to you. Aloha. Mahalo. Hurrah. Go